thankful this morning for a group that uh, knows the heart of God. We, we talk a little bit once in a while, back and forth, the message of scriptures, but I'll tell you this, they always seem to know exactly what we need to lead us in worship. And I've really needed that this week because I was sitting there thinking, I don't know of a time that I have written and rewritten a message, written notes and thrown away notes, even to putting some together this morning and still walking in the pulpit wondering what in the world am I doing here. <laughs> I'll just be honest with you. There are some times that the road the Lord leads us down are very hard to understand. That song is pretty well the conundrum that, that we're in. God says and we think. God says and we say. And there's this friction that even in the life of a believer that's not a total, total sellout. Total being all there because of the ties because of this flesh that we have to live in for a while. And such is the tone of the message this morning in listening to my people. And I thank God for this church and everyone in it. But over 41 years in ministry, both myself and those that I've come in contact with seem to be searching for just that purpose in life. Uh, have you ever asked yourself, what is my purpose in life? Even asking that question, it can go in so many different directions, it's not funny. What is the purpose of my life in this man that I know or this woman? What is the purpose in my life as it relates to this job that I have, these, these talents that I seem to What is the purpose of life? And what muddies the water so much is that we have bought in to one of the many lives of Satan. You see, Satan never really gives up on us. I think there's some time we think that we hear God's voice and we respond to God's voice and we come to God that Satan goes, oh well, I've lost another one and goes on and bothers someone else but he doesn't. Oh, he will discourage you with encouragings. You say, now how is that possible? Well, it's, it's like this. One of the great lies that has been perpetuated into the life of the body of Christ is that there are things that are sacred and things that are secular. Back in the temple, they consecrated sacred things to be used simply in the temple and that was their only only reason for existing i'm thinking of the gold shields that david had made and every once in a while he would bring them out and the guards would stand with these gold shields but those gold shields were stolen taken away captive and melted down and used by an enemy these things, though there are things that are set aside for God as sacred, and then we in, live in a world that talks about our secular life, we've allowed the forethought to believe that we are charged to try to balance two existence, the secular life and the life that we live every day, and then the sacred life or spiritual life call this spiritual for a while, but I, I'm adding sacred spiritual for one reason. Most everybody today will tell you they are spiritual, but you really got to watch out and figure out what spirit they're worshiping and what spirit is filling them. So I added sacred spiritual. We, we wrestle with this. Satan says, don't worry about it. Listen, I got it. You go ahead and work, get married, live life. You know, you only go to church on Sunday. If you're really feeling good, you'll go Wednesday night. Maybe you'll volunteer some. Don't worry about it. 
don't let your Christian life move into your secular life because it'll mess you up. It will keep you from achieving all that you can achieve in this world. And over the years, we've bought into that lie. I remember when they ordained me to the gospel ministry. They said they were ordaining me to the full-time gospel ministry. And that's how we have lived our life in the church. Called pastors are full-time. Others were part-time. We, we try to figure out how to have a stable life juggling two worlds. I wrote down some things. Secular, your marriage, your occupation, children, home, hobbies, vacations, various life decisions that you'll make. Then I made a little list for the sacred or spiritual what I could come up with is church attendance, giving to the church, figuring out where to serve, figuring out where you can volunteer, even figuring out what church should I go to. Much of our Christian life exists around these divided categories. And as a result, our minds are divided our priorities are divided, and our time is divided. We are continually leaning one way or the other, and we're unable to be our very best at either one of them. So as a result, we live burdened down with guilt. Or we harden ourselves to the gift, justifying things in order to relieve this pressure. But we never attain the freedom, the peace, and the joy, and the contentment that God has ordained for believers in Christ. You see, the confusion is, is we're going to, in a minute, I'm going to read you a scripture that says we have been bought with a price. And we are to reckon ourselves as bought with a price. And yet, the scripture tells us there is a freedom in Christ. And if you're not careful, you get into another conundrum. Am I bought with the price and on? Or is there a freedom for me to live in? I was sitting there thinking about an example that I've read from history. It seems Abraham Lincoln visited a slave market. And there was a young woman brought there to be bought, and Abe bought her. He outbid everybody for this young lady. They gave her him the change in which to take her away, and he led her directly to his office where he took off the change and sat down and wrote her an emancipation of her freedom setting her free, telling her she could go. He would provide the means for her to be established. She could go anywhere that she wanted to go. But that young girl served Abraham Lincoln all the days of her life. She had been bought with a price, and yet she was free, and she chose to serve. You see, that's the way we are in reality, folks. God created each of us in our mother's womb, not by accident. God forbid that we call children accidents. He formed us beautifully, miraculously, brings us into life, breathes the breath of life in us. From that time on, there's that call to him. Because in this life, we're born with a nature of sin inherited from our forefather and foremother, Adam and Eve. This distinctly fleshly desire for its own way. Christ calls us. We respond and we come to him. And within us, God places 
that priceless Godhead nature in us. The Spirit of God is in us. But not only that, Scripture tells us the Godhead, Father, Son, Spirit, dwells and lives in our very being. And then there is this conflict between this flesh in which the road of sanctification that will uh, and, uh, at one time will at always will end when we stand before God is that process of the Spirit controlling the flesh which we by ourselves could not control. Yet God says, I'll give you that power. I'll give you an overcoming power. And our life in Christ and our walk in Christ is to walk away from the old and experience the newness of freedom every day, even though we've been bought with a price. And that was a priceless price, the scourging, the blood of Jesus Christ. Have you ever really asked? Have you ever really sought? You know, some people say sought. That sounds biblically, preacher. You know what? That is a beautiful word. Seeking or looking is what I do. When I go to a refrigerator and open the door and say, Kathy, where is such and such? Where did you move it? And she'll walk over my shoulder and put her finger on it. See, I have a habit of not salting things. I know that's, I just made that word up. I like it. To seek something with your whole heart is to seek diligently till you find it. Like the parable of the lady that lost her coins, the only money she had, and she swept her house. I imagine she threw everything out of the house and swept till she found it because it was priceless to her. Have you diligently sought God's plan for your life? You see, as a believer, you're fortunate. Because as a believer, God has a plan for your life. You know, the Bible, the Bible is very plain about some things. Things that should not make us boast, but should humble us to the ground. That in this world, there are only two types of citizens of this world. Those who belong, confess, and live in Christ, and those who are an enemy of God. There's no middle ground. Jesus himself said, you're either for me or you're against me. There is no gray. There is no middle ground. But as a child of God, from before you are born... God has plans and purposes for your life and everything that he has done in your life, even those experiences like a lot of us have when we are going astray, we're living our own life, God has a way. God has a way of taking a mess and making it beautiful and be in his purpose and just fit together. You see, the devil would have you believe you're the summation of the worst times of your life in order to overburden you, or he will lift you up and tell you you're the summation of your life of the very best you've ever been, when in reality, until you close your eyes in death, there is no summation of your life you're simply bringing the parts and the pieces together to a master potter who will mold that so that no cracks or blemishes is seen and it is a vessel that is holy to God. Is the life in Christ divided? Are we forever damned to live e secular and sacred? How can the whole of my life become one sacred spiritual person, a purpose? No doubt you're asking that question. It's a good question. And the last question I wrote down is, were the apostles the only ones called to full-time service? That's a legitimate question. Were the apostles, when you read the Bible, 
just the apostles, full-time service. Everybody else had a secular life. Then they would attend temple, synagogue, or church down by the river. We're going to look at that this morning. I found a, a text that's one of those texts that we kind of jump over. Everybody knows the text about the call of the Macedonian man. My friend Milton in a tape inviting people to join him with partnerships. He says, I'm like the man from Macedonia saying, won't you come over and join us? We know that. But I have we ever looked at this call. I believe in these, what, four verses. God will show you how he will shape the life of any believer who wants to find that purpose for their life, that godly purpose. Read with me from Acts chapter 16. I'm going to begin reading in a moment in verse 6. To set this up, Paul and Barnabas have had a fight. It was a severe fight because the scripture says sharp disagreement. I'm coming from chapter 15 just prior to that. And as a result, Barnabas grabbed John Mark over whom the argument was about and they went one way. Paul reached out to a man of Sil named Silas and he took Silas with him. And it says that they went through Syria and Sicily strengthening the churches. It talks about him going to Derby and Lystria. There they found a young man of Jewish mother and Greek father named Timothy, who Paul would bring under his wing, nurture and minister to him, and leave him in charge of some of the most important work Paul has done. Then we come to verse 6. And they went through the region of Pelagria and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bethania. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia standing there, urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately it says, We sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I have heard this text be so misused it brought me to tears. The Holy Spirit was not forbidding the speaking of the Word of God. Neither was Paul like a pinball. I don't know if they still have pinball machines. That's old time it. You can't get that on the phone, I don't guess. Maybe they do have an app. But you flip, and you flip the ball all over the place. And the idea is to keep the ball flipping, going from place to place, racking up points. And sometimes we think about our life like that. That's the way I've spent my life. I'm just here, boom, boom, boom. But here we see the beautiful guidance of a person willing to be used by God. Paul's choice, use me in any way. This forbidding was simply urging and correcting the course of someone that was already in motion. You can't direct any life that is not in motion. If someone is sitting still, it doesn't matter the possibilities. It doesn't matter what you say to them until they decide to become, move, begin moving. You can't push and move and adjust and lead that life. And this is what was happening to Paul. You see, this was a non-intentional missionary journey. A missionary journey prior to Paul, he just went from place to place, new place to new place, finding believers, establishing churches. But here he was just going to go through. I think he was going to take Silas. 
and say, Silas, let's go look at my work. And, and so that Silas would become known by these churches so that Paul could double himself. You see, the life of a Christian is to continually reproduce yourself, reproduce what you do and move. So he was taking him on this little journey. They were unable to go to the left, <laughs> to Asia. They couldn't go to the right, to Bithynia. The only way remaining was straight to the coast of Troas. If you were in our Wednesday night Bible study, you saw a map. And Troas was on the wall right on the sea. So that's where they went. And there, God had placed Paul in a position for Paul to recognize and hear the voice of a man that was calling in reality, it was God speaking through this man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Not only did God put Paul in a position to be able to hear and understand, he also put him in a position to make that journey because Troas was a major shipping line. And so he got on a ship. He, Silas, and Luke, and possibly Timothy, made their way to Macedonia. You say, well, what's the importance of that? That was the first instance of the gospel being preached on the continent of Europe. Europe, the birthplace of our ancestors. For the United States was established by Christian people from Europe. And the first message of the gospel of Christ was brought by a man who simply put himself in a position to be used by God, trusting God for the means, trusting God for the provisions, and trusting God for the outcome. That's the secret in life. I'm going to make a statement that you may think is crazy, but it's not. The picture of a particular church, the work and the mission of that church is not solely defined by the pastor. This week, I've, in the last couple of weeks, in preparing this, I've talked with several pastors. Several have said you can't possibly say to the people, what is God saying to you about the mission, the journey, and the vision of your church? He said, do you realize you could have hundreds of different ideas and they may not even fit what you think they ought to do and you're the pastor? Well, I'm all that over. And I think it's a pretty good idea. You see, when I came here, I heard people say, like, Pastor, we're beginning to see your vision. We're beginning to know where you're coming from. And that's good. That is my responsibility as a pastor to set a ship, as with may, we'll use that, sailing. God uses me, all of my life experiences, the talents, the ability, the giftedness. And he uses me to go into Scripture and vision to the body of Christ that he blesses with me a particular destination. Okay? It's a destination. And that destination is heaven. Along the way, I'm to say to you that Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20 was not given to the church at first and neither was it Acts 1.8. You all know well. Go and make disciples of all the world, teaching them to observe all things that I've told you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Those are the commissions and the only way they become a part of the commission of a body of Christ is through the individual command that God has given, <clears throat> excuse me, every believer to fulfill that commission. 
Because when God spoke to his disciples, when Peter spoke to the large, uh, God spoke to his disciples again before he ascended, he was saying to you, when you build my church, when you form these churches, this is the message that I give you personally, and every member of that church is the body of Christ. Do you remember our study in the book of Acts? You are the body. God has given you these two commands. God will equip you to fill it out. And the greatest thing that runs through my mind is a group of people who seek the face of God to how to use their talents, abilities, the giftedness that God has given them, those spiritual gifts, those yearnings in their heart, all of those life lessons, all condensed in the body that God has created through the new birth in Christ. When they begin to spark up, and this thing comes, and this, and this, and this, then we can begin to see the mission, the journey of the body of Christ called Community Baptist. A church cannot survive on the vision of the pastor alone. The scriptures, in fact, say, unless the pastor has a vision, the people perish. Anybody catch that? That's a wrong quote. Don't write that down. <laughs> the Bible says, unless the people have a vision, they will soon perish. And I want to say to you this morning that God has uniquely called every believer, not only in Christ, but in this particular location. And as we come together and view our Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and we throw away this idea of a divided life, secular and sacred, and realize that when Christ calls us from the dead, out of darkness, breathes life into our lungs as surely as he breathed the first breath of life into our lungs when we were born when we come together as the body of Christ, we are equipped. We have vision. And we begin to go into the fields that Christ himself said, they're already white with harvest. They're already there. I want you there. I want you to bring the word that will bring that harvest to life where I'm working. Oh, can you imagine... Let's just start with 25 or 30 people saying, I believe God is saying to me, this is where I need to minister. This is where I need to minister. This is how I use my gifts. This is what God created me for. Let me tell you what will happen in your life. That divided life and divided mind will absolutely be no more. The Apostle James said this, a double-minded man, we can insert person, is unstable in all that he does. Simply because, how many times have we said it? We'll be doing something, somebody will ask us a question, and we say, hey, I can't think of two things at one time. That's how we're made. But if you realize that in Christ, that secular has been made sacred and holy through the blood of Jesus. We're no longer trying to juggle church work into our busy schedule, our, sec our job into our church work. God perfectly plans and places and leads and guides and prepares so that the ministry of the church, which is to be a light in the darkness, and I'm sure you will all agree this morning, we're living in a dark, dark world that is desperately. Listen, in all of the evil that we see going on, you know what that is? That's people, apart from Christ, trying to find a peace in everything else and not knowing 
the only peace they can ever have is Jesus Christ. One search after another, one place, try this, do that, move it to a higher level because they are seeking the unfindable apart from the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, the body of Christ, have been given the blessed ministry of reaching by being a light in the darkness. I've said this to you all so many times. Wherever you are in a particular day, there goes Community Baptist Church. That's where you are. Somebody asks you, where do your church located? You can tell them, I cr- honestly, right now it's standing in front of you. You say, oh, I can't be that church. Oh, you are the church. Yeah, God says you are his people. You're a redeemed people. Read the stories of what God has done to his other redeemed people. He said to the waters of Nile, stand up and turn into dry ground. They did. That brought them out of captivity without any problem. When he finally got them to realize, to submit their way to him, and they entered that promised land, it was during the flood season and the Jordan had over overflown its blanks. I said, don't worry about it. Priest, y'all grab the ark and start walking. I've often thought about this. That first old boy that's holding those poles with the ark, he had more faith than number 12. You know why? Because time number 12 got his feet in the water, this guy was treading water. But you know what? The waters pulled back. And nothing, nothing, nothing prevented God's purpose for his people except for one thing. Disobedience. See, God's plan didn't fail. God said, if you'll follow me, I'll take your enemies out. And he began without firing an arrow. Slowly but slowly, they begin to separate themselves from a people of God to become a people who would own the country. Pretty soon, they begin to think, you know, things are going so well. All I've got to do is just continue like I'm going. But without the guidance barrier of the Spirit of God in our lives, we wander just as assuredly around in the wilderness, and many of us have spent year after year after year wandering in the wilderness of our lives. I got a challenge for you this morning. I mean this with all my heart. I'm not playing games. If you really want to know the will of God for your life. Number one, you've got to discover, number one, do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you know him personally? I'm not talking about church, religion, throw it out. I'm talking about this one-on-one relationship that you know, that you know, that you know, and there's a deep-seated confidence in your life. That's the first will of God for your life. This morning, you can accomplish that through obedience to coming to him. But let me speak to you believers this morning. We believers. Do you want to discover God's purpose and will for your life? I'm going to give you a way. It's a biblical way. It's not a quick way. It's not like taking one pill and losing 20 pounds by the time you wake up in the morning. That's a society that we're in now. If you will fast and pray in the Word of God, God will direct your paths. You say, oh, preacher, I, I can't fast. I have this, these ailments. Hey, I'm a diabetic. If I give away all food and drink, I'll clunk out. I'll be gone. I'll be seeing Jesus. <laughs> 
That's not what it's talking about. It's the, it's the willful, total, or partial abstaining from food or drink for a designated period of time for a designated purpose. That can be a meal. That can be taking your computer and your phone, shutting it off, and putting it in a drawer. Do you know what fasting does to you? You see, most of our life is involved in what am I going to have for dinner, and when I get through, what am I going to have for dessert, and then what will I eat for breakfast? You see, we just got all of the stuff. What are you? What are we? What are we? What are we? And when you just get along and say, God, I want to get along. I want to realize that I'm alone because I'm going to, I'm going to really, my body's going to go through suffering. My mind's going to go through suffering, but I am seeking your face. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired with the life that I'm living. I'm tired of the excuses that I give. I want to know what it means to live one life in Christ and to live that life without fear because in the hand of God, nothing can harm you. Nothing. And in this body here are unique people. Oh, man, there's uniqueness. The more I get to know you in depth, it's like, wow. You know what that means? It means hope in this community. It means hope to those children in Tanzania that we, we uh, support that care center, feeding, clothing them, giving them an education. The care center we support in Nambia. Those Sudanese who were without a country have come to Egypt and know Christ and come together and a pastor is able to lead them because you care. But you see, our ministries go further than that. You have ministries. You have talents and ability that will fulfill these for the good of man that I don't have and have not thought of. And it's simply my role as a pastor to bring all of those in and say, Lord, look at all these colors. Look at the kaleidoscope of colors. Paint a portrait of body life at Community Baptist. For the good of this community, those who are sitting in darkness and have yet to see the light, those who are suffering every day of their life because you hold a key that can set a spark of hope in someone else. See, that's how it works. That's how it works. God using how he made you, your personality, your life experiences, your giftedness, your talented stuff you like. God uses you to touch lives who have yet to be touched. Oh God, I pray, will you take that challenge Will you seek the Lord? Will you bring the secular into the life of where you live? Because you see, our body is a temple of God. The dwelling place of God. And there's nothing secular in the dwelling place of God. This morning, the challenge of Scripture, will you be like Paul? Let the Spirit move you to where he can astound you with what he'll do for you. Father, as we come to you this morning, only you can speak directly into hearts and lives, Lord. So many times when I get through, I feel like what a mess I've made. But, Lord, my confidence is not me this morning or any other time. My confidence is in the Lord. This morning, I pray that you would speak deeply into lives. I pray that you would give boldness for people to take a stand, to make a stand, to make commitments before you. God, guide me to know who I am in you. 
Lord, if there's a person here, you, they realize they're lost. They're trying to cover it up with going to church. Trying to cover it up with good works, but they know deep down inside if they faced you, they're not yours. God, what better time than right now to run to the arms of Jesus. God is leading you to this church. He said he'd bring us laborers. Are you a part of that labor force? Father, we have a diverse community, almost as if the world has come to our doorsteps. Give us the army to reach that world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand?